emerging leaders among the clergy and laity who serve the local parish, diocese, or orthodox nonprofits are encouraged to attend either in person or online. You can learn more information about this September 16 to 18 conference by going to orthodoxservantleaders.com. That's orthodoxservantleaders.com. We have to choose to recover the basic foundational understanding of the place of money and salvation. This has been a public service announcement of Ancient Faith Radio. Boldly proclaiming the truth of the risen Christ, this is Ancient Faith Radio, timeless Christianity, 24 hours a day. Search the scriptures as Christ our God said in the This is Search the Scriptures Live with Dr. Jeannie Constantinou. Join us for an interactive verse-by-verse -verse study of the Bible with one of Orthodoxy's most respected biblical scholars. Study along with us and share your comments and questions by calling 855-237-2346. That's 855-237-2346. Here now is Dr. Jeannie Constantinou. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Illumine our hearts, O Master who loves mankind, with the pure light of thy divine knowledge, and open the eyes of our minds to understand thy gospel teachings. Implant in us also the fear of thy blessed commandments, that trampling down all carnal desires we may enter upon a spiritual manner of living, both thinking and doing such things that are well-pleasing to thee. For thou art the illumination of our souls and bodies, O Christ our God, and to thee we ascribe glory, together with thy Father who is from everlasting, and thine all-holy and good and life-giving Spirit, now and ever and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Well, hello, dear brothers and sisters, and welcome to Search the Scriptures Live. I'm Dr. Jeannie Constantinou, and we are continuing our study of the Holy Spirit, and specifically the first couple of chapters of Acts of the Apostles, in which we learn about what happened after the resurrection with the coming of the Holy Spirit. And today's date is June 27th, 2022. And, um, we're finally, after having a couple of weeks dedicated to the Spirit and the things in between, the resurrection, etc., the ascension and just doctrine, doctrine or dogma about the Spirit, we're finally ready to discuss the actual day of Pentecost as it is described by St. Luke in Acts chapter 2. Now, before we go, and I have some an unbelievable statements by St. Gregory the Theologian for you about the Holy Spirit today. And of course, some beautiful insight by St. John Chrysostom. We got a little bit off topic last time because I deviated at the, at the end because St. John Chrysostom at this portion, at this set, uh, place in his uh, comments on Acts of the Apostles, um, started talking about his life as a bishop, and I hope you enjoyed that. Nobody complained, so hopefully it was something kind of eye-opening to see the kinds of things that he experienced, how people were criticizing him and this kind of thing. So I think it does. it's useful for us to remember what our clergy go through and, and that sort of thing. But um, Chrysostom was talking extemporaneously, and somebody did ask me once, and I've discussed this recently, but I will remind you why it is that we have these sermons by Chrysostom, by Augustine, by St. Gregory, the theologian and others, Origen and, and other early Christian thinkers and fathers. We have them because when someone was a renowned speaker, there was usually someone in the congregation who was taking notes as they spoke, not just one person, but usually three. So there were transcriptionists who took notes. Now, those of us who are a bit older, 
Remember when women who uh, wanted to become a secretary would study shorthand. There was a way that you learned how to take notes very quickly. I think something similar to that is to be a court transcriptionist. Uh, they, they'll, you'll see them sitting in front in the court with a little machine. That's different. It's not done by hand. But they learn how to um, take notes by uh, indicating certain symbols. So people in antiquity used to do this too. So as Chrysostom was preaching, even before he became a bishop, when he was just a, a presbyter in Antioch, he was famous as a preacher, and people would sit and in the congregation, these are professionals, not just somebody willy-nilly, and they would take notes. And then there was there were notes from two or three, usually transcriptionists, of his sermon. And they would all give the notes to Chrysostom or whoever the speaker was, and he would correct them. And from that, they would make a kind of a final version that was more readable. And maybe they didn't understand him or he would correct things, but they didn't correct them so as to polish them too much because what we see in Chrysostom's comments very often is his comments about what's going on right in front of him at the moment, that people were tired or they were hot or they were cold or they were watching the lamp lighter in the church instead of paying attention to the sermon, things like this. So he didn't remove those kinds of comments. So at any rate, this is how it is that we have these incredible um, orations and sermons by these wonderful fathers of the church and others who were not fathers of the church, like Origen, but also sometimes by pagans, because Chrysostom's teacher in Antioch was a very, very famous pagan orator called Libanius, and we have some of his extant uh, speeches also. So uh, this is uh, why we have these things. So it's good for us to know how this worked. So they didn't sit down usually and write commentaries. Chrysostom did not have the time as a busy pastor and later as a bishop to sit down and write commentaries. The reason why this is important is so that we understand how to read the fathers of the church. So Chrysostom was not trying to give every possible explanation of a passage. And sometimes he surprisingly skips over something you really wish he would talk about. So why does he? Because the sermon can only last so long, and maybe he was intending to talk about it, but he forgot, or he gets distracted by something. Oh, yeah, you know, just as uh, pastors do today, they have a, a notes, some notes or an outline that they intend to discuss with a sermon. Uh, with a congregation in uh, as a sermon, but then as they are talking, something else enters their mind. It could be topical, having to do with news of the day, or it could be an issue that's going on in the parish. And so whatever it is, you know how you're having a conversation with somebody and you're intending to go in a particular direction, but the conversation leads you to some other topic. Well, this happened very, very often with Chrysostom. So the reason why I'm telling you this is that the fathers, even though we follow them, they're not necessarily comprehensive. In other words, just because they didn't say this thing about this particular verse doesn't mean it isn't a valid interpretation uh, or that uh, we can't say it because they didn't happen to mention it in that particular sermon. So we know, I believe I've pointed this out to you in the past, that Chrysostom knew much more than he tells us. His knowledge and his expertise was much deeper than what we will ever know. But he also keeps his comments on a very basic level because he's preaching to a congregation. So I have read people who criticize Chrysostom because they said, oh, he's just this moralizing preacher. Well, yeah, he's a preacher because he's preaching to a congregation and he's a moralist, I suppose, because he wants to save his congregation. He wants to save them from hell. So his point, the point of the sermon is not simply to explain the text and stop there. This is not a, a, this is not an intellectual exercise, but to give them something which will help them in their spiritual life. So simply because he doesn't mention something doesn't mean that he doesn't know about it. There are a few places where he gives hints that his knowledge is much more expense, extensive than we will ever know. So uh, along those lines, let's talk about the Feast of Pentecost. So my comments are directed uh, in that direction. I, they're about the fathers of the church, 
because when Chrysostom begins to talk about this passage in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, he doesn't really say anything about the Jewish celebration of Pentecost. So that got me thinking, did he know about the Jewish celebration of Pentecost? And I think that he probably did, even though he doesn't happen to mention it there, because they can never say everything they know about a given passage. And this happens with if anybody who speaks about any subject. You have to limit your remarks to what your audience can absorb, uh, the purpose of your remarks, um, and, and many other factors, the amount of time you have, many other factors. So I would like to begin by talking about Pentecost for the Jews. What was it? It's it. They had their own um, holiday called Pentecost, and they still do. So Chrysostom begins by talking about this, but he doesn't really explain the Jewish feast of Pentecost. And so I will tell you what it is. There was a Jewish feast of Pentecost, and it took place 50 days after Passover. And they still call it Pentecost, and that's a Greek word, Pentecosti. So they used to call it Pentecost and still do. So just as our resurrection of Christ, the celebration, is the Christian Pascha, the Christian Passover, and then later, 50 days later, we have a Pentecost, a Christian Pentecost, that mirrors the Jewish celebration. The Jews had their Passover also. They remembered Moses and his exodus, him leading the people of Israel out of Egypt at the exodus. They had something that corresponded to that, you see. And that was something that they called Pentecost in Greek. And as I mentioned, even in English, they still will call it that. In Hebrew, the word was Shavuot. Okay, so the reason why this is good for us to know is because when we know about the Old Testament and biblical Judaism, we can understand New Testament stories and illusions better. We can better understand the significance of what Christ did and said and the significance of what the apostles did and said. So there is a real meaning behind the fact that the Holy Spirit comes on the Feast of Pentecost. So when Luke writes in Acts chapter 2, now the Feast of Pentecost had come, when the day of Pentecost had come, or Paul, it mentions in Acts, was hurrying to be in Jerusalem for the Pentecost, I'm not sure if he's thinking about an anniversary of the Christian celebration or the Jewish feast, which he was still celebrating because he was going to on to the temple to celebrate the Jewish feast of Pentecost. Of course, it corresponded with the Christian feast, but why? So we need to know why this event happened on the particular Jewish feast of Pentecost so that we can understand it in that light and not simply according to the Jewish meaning, because the fathers understand the, the difference between the Jewish celebration and the Christian one. So we don't simply study the Jewish meaning of the Old Testament and confine our interpretation to that. It's not enough for me to explain that to you. We have to bring it into the New Testament. We have to bring it and expose it to the light of Christ and understand what it means in the light of Christ. So, so then why did the Holy Spirit come on the Feast of Pentecost. Well, because Pentecost for the Jews and was and still is the celebration of receiving the law of Moses, the law on Mount Sinai. So let me explain to you. And when, once I do, I think you're going to understand perfectly why this was a feast for them. As you know, Passover celebrates their liberation from slavery in Egypt as led by Moses. They crossed, they got out, you know, the 10 plagues, remember all of that. They crossed the Red Sea and they're on their way to Mount Sinai. That's where they were headed. And that's actually what Moses asked Pharaoh for permission to do. Moses didn't start out by saying, let my people go. He said, 
We want to have permission to go worship our God on Mount Sinai. We need a week off to go worship our God. We need three days to walk there, a day to worship, and three days to come back. And Pharaoh said, you must think I'm an idiot. I'm not going to let you go for a week. Not simply because he needed the workers, but because Pharaoh figured that if they're gone, they're not going to come back, right? Because they were slaves. So this is when uh, Moses is insisting that they be allowed to worship God and Pharaoh refuses, you see. So finally, this is, ap- it is after this sort of contest between Pharaoh and Moses, and we really understand it's, it's between the gods of Egypt and the God of the Hebrews, that finally he begins to say, you have to just let us go completely. So he doesn't start out by asking, Moses does not start out by asking for the liberation of the, of the Hebrews immediately. He asks for permission to go worship God, and that's what Pharaoh refuses to allow. But finally, they get out of Egypt, right? So Passover for the Jews, and still today, celebrates their deliverance from slavery in Egypt. That's a historical event, right? So after they got out of Egypt, after the death of the firstborn, they walked to Mount Sinai. So it took a few days to walk to Mount Sinai. They passed through the Red Sea that parted and all of, all of that. And then they had to wait at the base of the mountain. And they had to purify themselves. They washed their clothing and they prayed. And Moses went up to the top of the mountain. Remember that? And he was up there for 40 days and 40 nights. Remember that? And then he came down with the two tablets the stone tablets of the Ten Commandments and inscribed by the finger of God. So he came down after 40 days. So that was about 50 days, you see. That's why 50 days after Passover, uh, they allow for a certain amount of time for them to walk and then time for Mount Moses to go up to the top of the mountain and then wait for him to receive the tablets of the law and then come down again. So that's 50 days after Passover that they have the celebration of Pentecost. So for the Jews, the Pentecost celebrates receiving the law of Moses. Now, the law of Moses is much more than the Ten Commandments, but they kind of symbolize the entirety of the law, okay? The law of Moses, usually when we refer to law of Moses, we're talking about what they call the ceremonial laws, the circumcision and the dietary regulations and the Sabbath rules and the laws of ritual purity, the ritual washings and the, and all kinds of other things, sacrifices, everything having to do with the law. When we say the law of Moses, usually we're talking about these thousands of different regulations. So they consider the law of Moses to be a blessing and they celebrate it on receiving the law on Pentecost. So, Why did the Holy Spirit come on Pentecost? Why did God, you see, God chose that. You see how perfect that was? How perfectly it it aligned? So when the Lord, the Lord was crucified and rose at the Jewish Passover or after the Jewish Passover. Why? Because there was a lot of meaning in that. The Lord rose after Passover because he was the fulfillment of the Jewish Passover. He was the Passover lamb who was sacrificed, right? And he rose from the dead. So he was prefigured in the Passover with the blood of the lamb on the doorposts. He saved the Hebrews from death and the original Passover back in the time of Moses. And now we say that his blood and the sacrifice of this lamb saves us from death and leads us not from slavery in Egypt to the promised land of Canaan, but from the slavery of of sin and death into the promised land of the kingdom of heaven. That's what the Christian Passover is. So we celebrate the Christian Passover. So for us, that's why we, Pascha just means Passover. The word, did you know that? Pascha means Passover in Greek. Okay, so we're calling it Pascha. We celebrate Passover. Not the way Moses did. Not the way the Jews did but the way the Christians understand its true meaning. So what the Jews did was a a type that was an outline, a sketch, a bare outline sketched in lines in black and white, like a black and white drawing. And what we have is the fullness in the person of Christ. So fast forward 50 days, 
and we have the fulfillment now of Passover. So what does the Jewish Passover celebrate? It celebrates receiving the law on Mount Sinai. Why? Because we don't think that that's such a great thing. All of those rules that they have to follow. The law is what guides the daily life of the Jews. The law of Moses. Remember, it's not just the Ten Commandments. We're talking about thousands of rules, especially for the, the Jews who really follow the law even today. Thousands of rules for daily life. That is their yoke. That's what guides their daily life. But what we received, what the followers of Jesus Christ received on that first Pentecost was the Holy Spirit. And that's because from now on, that is supposed to guide our lives. We leave the law of Moses behind. Everything is transformed in the light of Christ. You see? So this is why the Holy Spirit came on Pentecost, because it is through the Spirit that we now live this new life. And we're no, we're no longer living the law by following the law of Mo We're not, no longer living by following the law of Moses. So Chrysostom doesn't exactly talk about this. He says that uh, it, it takes place during the feast, that Pentecost, this event, the Christian Pentecost, takes place during the Jewish Pentecost so that the people who would, so that there would be a big crowd who would witness this also. He doesn't really talk about the um, uh, that kind of understanding. So it kind of got me wondering whether or not he knew about the Jewish feast of Pentecost. And I think he did. I think he did because um, Chrysostom was a priest in Antioch and Antioch had a very large Jewish population. And there is no way that he would not know about the fact that the Jews had a particular celebration that they called Pentecost because they would have called it in Greek Pentecosti, just like we call it Pentecost. So of course Chrysostom knew this, but he doesn't really talk about it very much. He does mention the crowd that was present, but he doesn't really talk about the event that the Jews were celebrating something very similar. So let us see what St. Gregory, the theologian, says about it. Listen to this. This is in his, on his, in, from his oration on Pentecost. That's oration number 41 at the end of section four. The Hebrews honor the day of Pentecost, and we also honor it. Just as there are other rites of the Hebrews, which we observe. You see how he's talking about the Christianization of these Jewish rites. This is Gregory the theologian now. Of course, um, if he knows about it, of course Chrysostom knows about it. All right, but Chrysostom didn't mention it. Why? Maybe he meant to and he forgot, or maybe he had other things he wanted to talk about. So this is what I'm trying to explain to you. That's why I began by telling you that the fathers don't always mention everything there is to know in interpreting a particular passage or explaining a particular story. It just happens to be, especially, remember, they're speaking extemporaneously. They're not reading. Chrysostom has prepared. He has the biblical text in front of him, but he's speaking extemporaneously. That is, without uh, reading off of a written sermon. All right? So going back to Gregory, the theologian, he says, just as there are, are other rites of the Hebrews, which we observe, such as Pascha, they were typically observed by the Hebrews, and by us, they are sacramentally reinstated. Now, what does he mean by typically? He doesn't mean customarily observed, but he means that they are a type that is, that they were what the Hebrews celebrate, celebrate and still celebrate is a foreshadowing of what was celebrated or will be celebrated by us today sacramentally. They are restated, reinstated. In other words, there's a transformation of this event by the Christians. And here is, uh, so Gregory the theologian says, and now having said so much by a way of a preface about the day, let us proceed to what we have to say further. So he has a rather lengthy oration on Pentecost. 
And um, some of it has, a lot of it has to do with the Holy Spirit, and we're going to be talking about it. But since we have arrived at, this is a good place to pause for our uh, little break. Let's go ahead, as we've arrived at the half hour, let's go ahead and pause right now. And when we return, we will begin to delve into the actual description of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And I will tell you what both Chrysostom and Gregory the Theologian tell us about it. Okay, join me after the break. Dr. Constantinou will be back in a moment, but the lines are open for your calls. The number is 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. Hi there. I'm Bobby Maddox, station manager of Ancient Faith Radio, and I would like to invite you to the 2022 Ancient Faith Content Creator Conference, which will be held at Antiochian Village from September 19th to the 22nd. The Ancient Faith Content Creator Conference is an outstanding professional development opportunity for creators of Orthodox Christian books and media. I am, of course, in charge of the radio and podcasting track, and I am pleased to announce that Ancient Faith Radio has four sessions devoted exclusively to the art and production of effective audio recordings, including one by Derek Cummins, an AFR producer, and another by Brian Jarbo, an engineer at National Public Radio. I myself will conduct introductions to the podcast process, as well as to the genre of podcasting. Be prepared to learn a lot and leave the conference motivated and energized. Hope to see you there. Register at store.ancientfaith.com slash content dash creator dash conference dash 2022. That's store.ancientfaith.com slash content dash creator dash conference dash 2022. We are back with Search the Scriptures Live with Dr. Jeannie Constantino. Have a question about the verses we are studying tonight? Give her a call at 855-237-2346. Here once again is Dr. Jeannie. All right, so we're talking about the story of Pentecost, the event of Pentecost. And I'm going to read it for you in case you forgot some of the details. This is the Revised Standard Version. And when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly a sound came from heaven, like the rush of a mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire, distributed and resting on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in his own language. And they were amazed and wondered, saying, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others, mocking, said, They are filled with new wine. And after this, St. Peter gets up to give a speech. And it's the first sermon on the day of Pentecost. This is often called, Pentecost is often called the birthday of the church. That's sort of a traditional way to refer to it. And that's okay. Although I've, I have read people and fathers who say that the church existed from the beginning, from the time of creation. And that's because the angels are also part of the church. But um, it is typical to call Pentecost the birthday of the church. And there's nothing wrong with this. So, they are in Jerusalem. So why in Jerusalem? Chrysostom talked about this. We mentioned this last week because that was where the Lord was crucified 
And that's where the people were, the crowds, who were witnesses to that event and would now be witnesses to this. So when we talk about what happened, you know, to Jesus and we talk about the witness of the apostles and others and why people believed in the message of the apostles, these were people who knew who Jesus was. They had seen him around town. They may have witnessed his miracles, certainly heard him preaching, and they were they knew very well what happened to him. They knew about the crucifixion and they also probably had heard about the resurrection by now because this was not ancient history. This was very recent history. It was only seven weeks in the past that these events had happened. So when Peter gets up and he starts talking about Jesus and the things that happened to him, um, that was not ancient history to his hearers. This was something that they had all lived through only a few weeks before at the time of Pentecost. So let's begin by talking about um, why the Spirit came in bodily form. St. Gregory, the theologian, talks about this. I thought it was very interesting that he talks about why, because, you know, we don't think of the Spirit as taking some kind of bodily form. And of course, it wasn't incarnate the way the Lord was. The Lord alone was incarnate. He appeared as a man. The Holy Spirit appears in two forms, as fire and also as a dove, like a dove. Not He wasn't incarnate as a dove, but because he does take this form that is visible, this is how we depict the Holy Spirit in iconography. So I have mentioned this in the past, but I'll tell you again. In Orthodoxy, we don't uh, depict the father, or we're not supposed to depict the father as an old man. There is actually a canon of the church against this because God, the father never took any kind of a form. So even though we think of him as father and because of Western art, we, we think of him as looking like an old man, that's really not considered appropriate. As a matter of fact, it's actually heretical because Everything in an icon has a theological meaning, and God the Father was never incarnate. We can depict the Son as a man because he took human form. He was incarnate as a human being, not just any kind of a human being, not as a woman, but as a man, okay, a male of the species, human being, but he was a male, not a woman. It's very important that we maintain these kinds of distinctions. Jesus Christ was incarnate as a male. That's not a sexist comment. It's a historical reality. So we must insist upon this, and we don't go in for this kind of modern idea, well, Jesus Christ is the child of God or uh, son or daughter of God. In other words, God is our parent rather than our father. There is a reason why God was revealed as father. And we have to accept that. I know that sometimes people have difficulty with this. I've actually had people say to me, I don't have a good relationship with my father or my father was abusive. And I don't like thinking about God as father because I don't have a good image of my father. Well, the, the point is not to then change the language because God was revealed as father for a reason. Because the father, our father usually protects us and he provides for us, right? We feel safe with the father around. Mothers also do this, but not the way the fathers do. And certainly not in antiquity. That was the father's role to provide and to protect. So if you have had a bad experience with your father, you should pray to God to begin to think about him as your father. He is your true father. That's why Jesus said, call no man father. Not because we're not supposed to call the priest father, but because ultimately we all have only one father, and that is our father in heaven. So if you had a bad experience with your human father who let you down for some reason, you have the opportunity to have a new relationship with a father, and that's your true father. That's God the father in heaven. But we don't depict him as an old man. We can depict Jesus Christ as a man because he was incarnate. But we cannot depict Jesus Christ as a lamb. In Orthodox iconography, we're never supposed to depict Jesus as a lamb. Sometimes you see that in Western churches. He's holding a banner because, you know, of the 
book of Revelation. But but that is specifically prohibited by the canons of the church, uh, the ancient church. This is nothing recent. This is really, really old, hundreds of years before the before the um, Great Schism, that we have these, uh, in, in the 7th century, in the 8th century, we have these canons against depicting him as a lamb because he was not incarnate as a lamb. He was incarnate as a man. He didn't become an animal. Now, because the Holy Spirit appeared to human eyes as fire and as a dove, we can depict the Spirit in those two ways, but not in some other way. You see my point? So everything in an Orthodox icon has theological meaning, and it is grounded in Scripture, okay, not grounded in somebody's imagination. So let's see why St. Gregory the Theologian expressed why the Spirit appeared in some kind of form, even though he really didn't, he wasn't incarnate as fire, he wasn't incarnate as a dove, but he took some kind of bodily form for us to be able to actually see the spirit when this thing happened, okay? For it was fitting, this is Gregory the Theologian, Oration 41, for it was fitting that as the Son had lived with us in bodily form, so the spirit also should appear in bodily form. And that after Christ had returned to his own place, he means to heaven, after the ascension, he, the spirit, should have come down to us. He came because he is the Lord. He was sent because he is not a rival God. For such words no less manifest the unanimity and they mark the separate individuality. We spoke about this a couple weeks ago, that the Holy Trinity is one God, that's the unanimity, and yet there are three persons. There are three individuals. So he speaks about the unanimity and the individuality. So he really saw the, come, the um, Holy Spirit, it was necessary for him to come in this bodily form because... Christ had also come in this bodily form. And it was important for us to see the coming of the Spirit in this very more tangible way, we could say. So, upon whom did the Holy Spirit come? Well, as you know, it wasn't just upon the Twelve. But Chrysostom mentions that everybody who was present there were about 120 people, were shown to be worthy. And the Holy Spirit came upon all of them, not just upon the 12, but upon the 120. And um, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. It would not have been necessary to say that the Holy Spirit came upon all of them if it had only come upon the 12. And so he's reading the text, Chrysostom comes to this conclusion that they would have made mention of the Holy Spirit coming upon the apostles specifically and not on the rest of the congregation, but if that was the case. But of course, all of them are mentioned as being present. And other in other instances, he mentions the apostles as somehow present and separates the apostles as receiving special gifts if it was only the apostles, but we know that this is not the case. And in fact, the Holy Spirit came upon everyone. And Chrysostom also mentions the fact that they were continuing in prayer. And it is because they were continuing in prayer that the Holy Spirit came upon all of them. I thought that that was a lovely observation that Chrysostom makes. Now, Chrysostom also talks about how they were shown because of their prayer, because of their unanimity, how the Holy Spirit came upon the entire congregation here of the early church. And then St. John Chrysostom contrasts that with the coming of the Spirit as it had come in the Old Testament on some of the great heroes of the Old Testament and how this was different. And by the way, we know that for each of us, we also receive the Holy Spirit in the same way that they received it on Pentecost uh, when we are chrismated. We receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and there are so many that we cannot count them. There are manifold gifts of the Holy Spirit, which we receive in our 
at our at our uh, chrismation. So why is that that we receive it as chrismation? Why weren't they all chrismated? Because the Holy Spirit had to come this first time, you see. And then after that, they gave began to give the Holy Spirit by the laying on of hands and by chrismation. But first, there had to be a direct coming of the Spirit to the church from God, okay, not mediated through the agency of another human being. And similarly, when the Lord breathes on the eleven in the upper room and says, receive the Holy Spirit, that's a special grace given only to the eleven, that was like an ordination of the eleven. They received a special grace separate from the rest of the church. When he says, receive the Holy Spirit, and he breathes on them and says, those who sins you forgive are forgiven. Those who sins, sins you retain are retained. That's separate than the coming of Pentecost because they were in a special leadership position. And that's a special grace. It had to come directly from the Lord the first time. After that, then by the laying on of hands, they would ordain others to these offices in the church. But it had to come directly from the Lord initially. And here we see the same thing with Pentecost the coming of the Holy Spirit directly upon them. So as Chrysostom begins to talk about the coming of the Holy Spirit on these, he also is reminded of the coming of the Holy Spirit or the receiving of the Spirit by certain people in the Old Testament. So he mentions David first, okay? He mentions David, how simple and how absolute was his faith. And he also received the Holy Spirit, okay? And Moses was also received, uh, was seen as worthy of receiving the Holy Spirit. These were men, a great man who also were, had the Holy Spirit. Moses, he says, despising royalty and forsaking all. And after 40 years, leading the people in the desert and Samuel occupied there in the temple and Elisha left everything and Ezekiel manifested everything. And all of these men left everything they had. And they learned also from what they suffered, and they learned that it was not in vain that they had done this, that they had left everything, that they had done these good works. But none of them received the Spirit, Chrysostom says, the way the church did on Pentecost. Even Moses, this is Chrysostom, who was the greatest of the prophets, yet he, when others were to receive the Spirit himself, suffered diminution. Okay. Indeed, he had foretold that the that those who believed in the Spirit would receive a wellspring of water uh, welling up into eternal life. For they did not go forth to argue with Pharaoh, but to wrestle with the devil. So they made no objection. So Moses actually objected, right? Uh, uh, now, he's, when he says they did not go forth, he's talking about the people who received the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. They didn't go forth to argue with Pharaoh, but to wrestle with the devil. Isn't that beautiful? So they, this is the members of the church, did not make any objection. And he's here referring to Moses. Moses, when God called him by appearing to him in the burning bush, said that he is weak in voice and slow of tongue. And Jeremiah, a great prophet that he was also, said, I'm too young. I can't, you can't send me out as a prophet. Jeremiah objected to receiving of the spirit, you see. And yet they did not receive the fullness of the spirit because the fullness would come at Pentecost. And what the church received was much, much greater than what any of these great men received. David, who spoke, who prophesied through the spirit because he wrote the Psalms, which are prophetic. And Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Moses and all of those great men did not receive, think about this, dear brothers and sisters, they did not receive what we received, what you received when you were chrismated. Now, do you remember on uh, the Feast of All Saints and also on the um the first Sunday of, of Great Lent, Sunday of Orthodoxy, and also, when is the third time? Oh, yes, the Sunday before Christmas. We, re we read from the book of Hebrews, and it talks about the great heroes of the Old Testament. It's my favorite reading. It's just phenomenal. It talks about how they stopped the mouths of lions and quenched raging fires and 
you know, women received their dead by resurrection and they went about and the, they lived in the caves and wandering about in dens and caves of the earth and dressed in the skin of animals. And yet they did not receive what was promised. Why not? Because we received what was promised. We received the Holy Spirit. So we have to stop thinking about ourselves as having as being lesser, as having less potentiality, we could say, than those great heroes of the Old Testament. Certainly we're less than they are now because we're not living the life of the Spirit as we ought to be. But if we were living the life according to the Spirit, which we have already received, we would be doing much greater things than any of those heroes of the Old Testament. But we're not, okay? because we don't recognize what we have received. We're sort of like Moses making our objections, right? Or Jeremiah. We're not really, we're saying, we're giving excuses for why we can't really receive the Spirit, why we can't really live the Christian life as we ought to. At any rate, you get the idea. So it came upon those, Chrysostom says, who were worthy, those who were part of this incredible group, who were always together, united, and praying constantly. So why did it come upon them? Because they were worthy. So he says, now, I'm looking for another passage here in Chrysostom. So, uh, you know, it's interesting because Gregory the theologian says basically the same kind of thing, that this was promised and it came upon them because of their great prayer that it came to the to the people in the upper room and this listen to this because it was interesting he also talks about why it happened to them when they were in the upper room he sort of we can say allegorizes it to a certain degree it took place in the upper room because those who should receive it were to ascend and to be raised above the earth for also certain upper chambers are covered with divine waters. And Jesus himself in an upper chamber in the upper room gave the communion of the sacrament to those who were initiated into the higher mysteries. Thereby it might be shown on the one hand that God must come down to us as I know he did of old to Moses. And on the other hand, we must go up to him so that there should come to pass a communion of God with men by a coalescing of the dignity. That's Gregory, the theologian. So God comes down to us, but we also have to make the effort to ascend up to him. That's what, what he said. So now, what about the sound? The sound as of something like a rushing wind, and it also appeared as fire. Why did it make this sound like a rushing wind? Of course, the wind, the Holy Spirit, benevma also means breath, and in Hebrew it also means wind. So there's a lot of significance to this. This we discussed it in chapter 3 when we talked about the Gospel of John. But it was it expressed itself or it came in a very sudden way that was startling, Chrysostom says, and like the sound of a rushing mighty wind, because it's about, it shows what Chrysostom says, the vehemence of the spirit, the power of the spirit, and the copiousness of the spirit, that there was an outpouring of the spirit. And it was so strong that it was like something that no one could withstand. The spirit is something that no one can withstand, Chrysostom says, that anybody who fights against the spirit will be blown away like all adversaries, like a heap of dust. And the Holy Spirit filled the entire room. And of course, not only do they hear this sound like a wind, but they begin to see fire fill the room. And then it is distributed upon each of them. And it divides itself into tongues like fire. And Chrysostom makes this point. Why does it say it's like fire? Well, here's Chrysostom. He says, there appeared to them, it says, cloven tongues as a fire. Observe how it is always like as and rightly, that ye may have no gross 
sensible notions about the spirit. He doesn't mean that you're sensible versus irrational. He means not sensory. It is not an actual fire, but it was a manifestation of the coming of the spirit. Okay. And it was made known to them as a fire, just as it had been made known to John. Remember John, we're talking about John, the forerunner when he was preaching before the coming of Christ, he said, the one who comes after me will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. John made that prophecy. John, the Baptist, made that prophecy that Christ would come and would bring the Holy Spirit and baptize people with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now, when John was baptizing the Lord, the Holy Spirit came upon him in the form of a dove, like a dove. But now, when the whole multitude was to be converted, that is to be baptized with fire, it was like as a fire. And Chrysostom says it sat upon each one of them. And this means that it remained, it rested upon them. And this signifies settleness and continuity. Okay. So the fact that it's resting upon them means it wasn't a momentary thing. It, it They received it and it remained upon them. So it remained with them. Now, this is something again, which is different from what we have seen in the past with the men of old and very similar to what uh, St. Gregory, the theologian says, Chrysostom says the same kind of thing. And I want you to notice the consistency here in the way these two fathers speak. And one, they came from two very different places. And both of them eventually became Archbishop of Constantinople. But they then they say very similar things because there was a consistency in the way the church interpreted these scriptures and understood the meanings of these things. It's not correct to say that the fathers always disagree with each other. They all have their own ideas. Sometimes one brings out one element and another brings out another. But there's a lot of consistency. If you really read the fathers, if you really know them, you see the consistency not only between people of the same era, like Chrysostom and Gregory the theologian, but people like Chrysostom with earlier fathers, like Hippolytus and Irenaeus. You see a consistency that they're drinking from the same well, the same well of the Holy Spirit when they make their comments, because there was an understanding of what these details meant in the, in the life of the church. So Chrysostom talks about how the, how the spirit appears as fire and it fills the room, which is something quite startling, but then it divides and it's cloven. That means it's divided. And Chrysostom says this means because it came from one root that you might learn that it was an operation sent from the comforter. And I was mentioning that what Chrysostom says about the difference between how the Holy Spirit operated during the era of the Old Testament and how it was received now by the church, he makes very similar points to what, what Gregory the theologian had made. And not because he was a student, because he wasn't, but because they were reading the same fathers who came before them. That's why we read the fathers, dear brothers and sisters, because we want to be of the same mind as them. We read what they said because we, we read them with the fathers. There are fathers of the 20th century and of the 19th century, the 18th century. They read what the fathers of the 16th and 15th and 14th and 13th centuries. So we're always reading what those who came before us in the church, the great saints of the church, said about these passages so that we will also have the right and the same mentality so that we will not deviate by introducing our own ideas. You see? So... Chrysostom says, also like Gregory the theologian, that Elisha received the grace of the Holy Spirit, but through the medium of a mantle, right? Because he received it from Elijah, when Elijah threw his mantle down. And David received it when he was anointed with oil. And Moses by the fire when he encountered God in the burning bush. In other words, can you see what he's saying here is that these great, great prophets of old received something that was mediated. It wasn't a direct experience of the Holy Spirit. And yet we have received something that is not mediated. It is the Holy Spirit that we receive directly, just as they received it at Pentecost. But in the present case, this is Chrysostom, it is not so. 
for the fire itself sat upon them. All right. This is what he's saying, that this was something that they received through their, uh, through the, in, that was what the, what the apostles and those who were with them received initially on the day of Pentecost. It was different from, not that it's a different spirit, but they received the spirit in its fullness because it was unmediated by anyone. Uh, very different from what had happened, where they received a sort of a gift of the spirit. Certainly the spirit was active in the Old Testament also, but what the church receives is the fullness of the spirit at Pentecost. So let's take a break at this moment and join me after the break as we continue our discussion of, of Acts of the Apostles, chapter two, the story of Pentecost. Dr. Constantinou will be back in a moment, but the lines are open for your calls. The number is 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. New from Ancient Faith Publishing. The Crucifixion of the King of Glory. The Amazing History and Sublime Mystery of the Passion. Written by Eugenia Scarvellis Constantinou, Ph.D. It is my wish that this book will transport you on a journey of discovery, alternating between the dramatic, the informative, the spiritual, and the inspirational. But above all, it is my sincere hope that it will open the world of Christ to you and give you a behind-the-scenes glimpse into the last week in the life of Jesus Christ leading to a deeper appreciation of his passion that you will never forget. The Crucifixion of the King of Glory. Now available in paperback, ebook, and audiobook at store.ancientfaith.com. We are back with Search the Scriptures Live with Dr. Jeannie Constantinou. Have a question about the verses we are studying tonight? Give her a call at 855-237-2346. Here once again is Dr. Jeannie. All right, so it tells us, Chrysostom is telling us that they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what the text says. They didn't simply receive the grace of the Spirit, which is something that the men of the Old Testament received. They definitely received the grace of the Spirit. The Spirit was active in the era of the Old Testament, too, with the people of Israel, but they did not receive the fullness of the Spirit. And this is what the church received on the day of Pentecost. Now, there's another aspect of this particular um, reading, this particular passage, which is quite interesting. You may have heard this before, and we need to talk about it. And that has to do with the people who received the Spirit. I mean, the people who were part of the crowd, we could say. Part of the crowd, because, and by the way, I'm going to look at you see why the tongues were cloven. Oh, by the way, um, Gregory, the theologian, says that the tongues were cloven because of the diversity of gifts. So this is what he thinks It is re is represented by the fact that the fire is distributed upon each of them. And the, the fact that it looks like it's somehow cloven means divided. That's an old fashioned way of referring to divided. All right. Now, there is a question about the different tongues that they spoke in. And I often get this question. So we're going to talk about this. What were, exactly were they speaking? And it says in the biblical text that they come, they came out of the upper room and people who were there, men of Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under the sun, it says, were there, and they heard them speaking. And they heard them speaking in their own language. And Chrysostom talks about how there are really two different kinds of people that were dwelling in Jerusalem, devout men. Uh, the fact that they were living in Jerusalem, they were from all over the world. And this was a sign, Chrysostom said, of their piety. Being of so many nations, they left their country, their home, and their relations, and decided to dwell in Jerusalem. And that's true, and it's still true of the Jews. There are many Jews who will leave their native country because they want to live in the land of Israel. So because of their piety, they were living in Jerusalem. 
And it tells us that they were from different parts of the world where even though Greek was the common language, there was nonetheless a common, a kind of a native language. And they heard all of these Galileans speaking their own native language. And they were confounded. It says they were confused. Now, some of, there was two groups of people who experienced this. We could say, yes, there were two groups because Chrysostom mentions that there is a group of people who are confounded. They're confused. They're trying to understand it. The piety of some of them, Chrysostom says, some of them are pious. As the multitude comes together, they were confounded. They are confused. They don't understand how these Galileans, and they could tell they were Galileans by their manner of dress, because people from different parts of the world had a different way of dressing. So by looking at them, everybody could, you can instantly tell somebody's social class and also where they were from. So they said all of these men, of course, people, there were women too, are Galileans. They could tell by their manner of dress. How is it that, they're, that they know our native language? We're from Parthia and Medes and Phrygia and Pamphylia and Mesopotamia and Libya and places like this. So Chrysostom says, observe their piety. They pronounce no hasty judgment, but are perplexed. Whereas those reckless ones pronounce it one saying, these men are full of new wine. Okay. So in other words, there were two types of people who overheard them. Some of them who were pious and devout, they were devout because they had left their native land so that they could live in Jerusalem near the temple so they could be praying constantly. And yet there are others who experience the same thing. They hear men speaking in different languages and they say, oh, they're just drunk. They've had too much wine, right? So now I forgot where I was going with that, but anyhow, you get the idea. Let's go ahead and talk about the different tongues. That's right. That's why we we're talking about that. The different tongues that they spoke. What kind of question do I often receive? The question that I often receive about this passage is, were they speaking different languages or were the hearers hearing them speak different languages? There's a difference. Are you following what I'm saying? In other words, did the early Christians, I'm, I'm not just saying apostles, although all of them really are apostles, all of them are witnesses because apostle is more than just the 12. Everybody is who is an eyewitness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who saw him in bodily form again, is an apostle at this time in the early church. So we have this large crowd of people who are speaking foreign languages, or is it that they are hearing them in their own language, but the person is speaking, in other words, they're speaking Hebrew or Aramaic or whatever, but the person hears them in their native language. And the reason why people say this is because when the crowd of Jews, the pious Jews who are from all over the world are listening, this says they're amazed and saying that we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And by the way, Chrysostom comments on that. They're not just talking. They're not just talking about the weather or something trivial. They're talking about God. So they're speaking in these different languages, but they're speaking about the mighty acts of God. It's really beautiful. I, I really love that. So is it that they were actually speaking these foreign languages or were, was, was the listener hearing them speak in their own language? Now, this, by the way, when they speak of the word tongue, they're not talking about the gift of tongues in which there's this sort of heavenly language that seems to have been part of the early church in which they were receiving these, um, they were speaking in a kind of gibberish that was not an earthly language. So the word tongue is something it's kind of old fashioned in English, but in Greek, it means both the gift of tongues. It means your actual physical tongue, but it also means language. Okay. So here we're not talking about that gibberish sort of heavenly language that nobody could understand. We're speaking about actual human language that differs depending upon where you come from in the world. So what is it now? Chrysostom talks about this and so does, but he doesn't really discuss. He's, he assumes 
that they are speaking in the language of that foreign land. So that's Chrysostom. But Gregory the theologian also comes to that conclusion. However, Gregory the theologian also discusses the fact that this is a matter of discussion or debate. Because I have had people tell me that it is not that they were actually speaking those languages, but that the listener heard them in their own language. And by the way, that's not impossible. It's not impossible because there are stories like this of saints who are communicating with people in a language that they don't even know. And I I remember reading about this recently. I I wish I had found the story. I, I can't remember where I saw it, but I read it recently in the, in the stories about St. Paisios, that he was with someone, there was a, a person who was very sick, and for some reason Paisios was, was there, and he was talking to a German doctor, and the person who was um, like a relative of the sick uh, man was listening to Paisios conversing fluently in German with the doctor, about the condition of this sick person. And after the conversation was over, uh, they said to Baisios, um, I didn't know you spoke German. He says, I wasn't speaking in German. He was speaking in Greek. So this is also the Holy Spirit at work. And this is not the, the only time we've heard of similar stories where literally the saints are speaking in Greek, but the person hears them in their own language. That is a definite fact. But let's see what St. Gregory the Theologian says about this question. They spoke with strange tongues, not those of their native land. This is speaking about the apostles, those who received the gift on Pentecost. And the wonder was great, a language spoken by those who had not learned it. And the sign is to them that did not believe, not to those who believe, Here, I will stop a little and raise a question, how you are to divide the words, for the expression has an ambiguity, which is to be determined by the punctuation. Notice this. Now, here, St. Gregory the Theologian mentions punctuation, and he mentions it because at this time, if you were to look at uh, an image of what the Bible looked like at the time in the fourth century when Gregory the theologian was alive and Chrysostom was alive, you would see that it's a solid block of letters and everything is capitalized and there is no punctuation. So you had to sort of supply the punctuation. You had to decide for yourself whether or not something was a quotation Today, we don't do that because an editor has decided what is quotation or the author today. Authors decide for themselves. But in those days, that wasn't the case. You had to decide where this, where the sentence ended, whether it was a statement or a question, what was a quotation and what part of the sentence was not intended to be a quotation. So notice that St. Gregory is dealing with this and he says that this is ambiguous and is determined by the punctuation. There is no punctuation for him, so he has to punctuate it. Here's the question. Did they each hear in their own dialect so that, if I may so say, one sound was uttered, but many were heard? So was one thing spoken? In other words, all of those people who were present in the upper room on the day of Pentecost were speaking in Aramaic, but everybody in the crowd heard different languages? Is that the question? Or, if I may say so, one sound was uttered, but many were heard, the air being thus beaten and, so to speak, sounds being produced more clear than the original sound, or are we to put the stop after they heard? And then to add them speaking in their own language to what follows, so that it would be speaking in languages their own to the hearers, which would be foreign to the speakers. I prefer it in this latter way. For on the other plan, the miracle would be of the hearers rather than the speakers. 
Are you following what he said? I thought this was an excellent point. So while we know that it is possible and that sometimes the saints would be speaking in Greek or some other language, but they would be heard in the native language of the person listening to them, that's possible. Here he says, it cannot be that. It must be that the people, the 120 who received the Spirit on Pentecost, we're actually speaking the foreign language. Otherwise, the miracle would be experienced by the hearers rather than the speakers. And I think that's an excellent conclusion. Okay? So it was this, that the Spirit wrought a miracle in the matter of the tongues. And he goes on to talk about the many tongues and that this is sort of a reversal of what happened at the Tower of Babel. For, but as of the old confusion of tongues was laudable, when men were of one language in wickedness and impiety, even as now some venture to be, when they were building the tower, for by the confusion of their language, the unity of their intention was broken up, and that their undertaking was destroyed. So much more worthy of praise is the present miracle for being poured from one spirit upon many men. It brings them again into harmony. Do you see what he's saying there? So I think that's a, a wonderful insight that Gregory, the theologian makes. Now with the few minutes that we have remaining, I would like to read to you what Gregory says about the Holy Spirit. It's a really wonderful, beautiful observations that he makes about the Holy Spirit. And it was so, what can I say? It was so lovely that I wanted to share it with you. And I'm having a little, I had some trouble. I wasn't able to print out my notes the way I normally do because I had some difficulty with my computer today. So I'm sorry that I'm a little bit halting. in my presentation. So let us begin by talking about what he says the purpose of the Holy Spirit is and also what the Holy Spirit accomplished and the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. So let's begin with this. He wrought first, he made first in the heavenly angelic powers, and such are as are first after God and around God. So first of all, he's talking about how the Holy Spirit participates. This is not the very beginning of the sermon, by the way. I'm having to jump because there's beautiful things that he says about the Spirit. He encourages the people to realize that the Spirit is God and not a creature. He goes through a lot of discussion about the theology which we don't have time for, but he says that the Holy Spirit was participating in the creation of the world. And the first thing that he made is the heavenly and angelic powers. He made them first before he made the earth. Okay. Such are as first around God. Okay. And then, um, for, from, so, from no other source flows their perfection and their brightness and the difficulty and impossibility of moving them to sin, but from the Holy Spirit. And next, we see the Holy Spirit in the patriarchs and the prophets. This is the Old Testament. Of whom the former saw visions of God. That's the patriarchs like Jacob and Abraham. Or who knew him. And the latter, that's the prophets, also foreknew the future, having their master part molded by the Spirit and being associated with events that were yet future as if they were present, for such is the power of the Spirit. And next, the Spirit was manifested in the disciples of Christ, and I omit to mention Christ himself, in whom he dwelt, not as energizing, but accompanying him as his equal. Notice that. When the Holy Spirit comes upon Christ at the baptism, and the Spirit that comes in the form of a dove and remains upon him. It's not because Christ needs the Holy Spirit the way we do, but it's part of the ministry of Christ. The Holy Spirit was involved in the ministry of Christ. And here, St. Gregory talks about this. 
okay, how the Holy Spirit was also part of the ministry of Christ. So he says that both of them were part of the ministry of Christ and they were on an equal footing. This was proclaimed by the prophets in such passages as follows. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. Now, where does he talk about? This is Isaiah. But Christ, is, uh, Christ read from this passage in Isaiah in Luke chapter 4. The spirit of the Lord is upon me, and there shall rest upon him seven spirits. And he mentions other places where people experience the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. This spirit shares with the Son in working both the creation and the resurrection. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all the power of them by the breath of his mouth. And this, the Spirit of God, that made me the breath of the Almighty that teaches me. And again, you will send forth your spirit and they will be created and you will renew the face of the earth. He is the author of spiritual regeneration. And here is your proof. So what Gregory the theologian is doing here is he's trying to show how the ministry of Christ was integrated with the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit energized and it was part of the ministry of Christ because, as we have already spoken, the members of the Trinity do all things together. They're not one does this and the other does that, but they do everything in, in union, okay, with a perfect union of will and intention and operation. So here is the proof that the Holy Spirit is the author of spiritual generation, regeneration, uh, Gregory says. No one can see or enter the kingdom unless he is born again of the Spirit and be cleansed from the first birth, which is a mystery of the night, by remolding the clay and of the light. This Spirit, for he is most wise and most loving, if he takes possession of a shepherd, makes him into a psalmist. He's speaking of David there. Subduing evil spirits by his song and proclaims him king. He makes him a prophet, called to mind David and Amos. If he possesses a goodly youth, he makes him a judge of elders, even beyond his years, as Daniel testifies, who conquered the lions in their den. If he takes possession of fishermen, he makes them catch the whole world in the nets of Christ, taking them up in the meshes of the word. Isn't that beautiful? So recently we had Pentecost and we were singing again and again the hymn of Pentecost that they that the apostles fished the whole world. I, li I like that. That's the translation that's used by the Antiochian archdiocese. Uh, we, we say they gathered everyone into their nets, but the, the Antiochians in English, they say they fished the whole world. It's a very beautiful poetic description. So, so Gregory continues, look at Peter and Andrew and the sons of thunder. That's James and John thundering the things of the spirit and of publicans he makes a gain of them for discipleship and makes them merchants of souls witness matthew yesterday a publican and today an evangelist and of zealous persecutors he changes them changes the current of their zeal and makes them paul's instead of saul's and as full of piety as he found them of wickedness. The spirit is the spirit of meekness, and yet is provoked by those who sin. Let us therefore make proof of him as gentle, not as wrathful, by confessing his dignity. Let us not desire to see him implacably wrathful. He too it is who has made me today a bold herald to you, if without rest to myself, God be thanked. But if with risk, thanks to him, nevertheless. Now, why am I stopping here to, why, why is he talking about this without risk and maybe with it, without rest, he says, or without risk. So here St. Gregory is speaking about his boldness about talking about the Holy Spirit 
and he's talking about him as God. And I didn't read to you the first like five pages of this oration where he explains how the Holy Spirit is God and why we should confess him as God, because that was a controversy at the time. But he didn't, he, he definitely spoke and he preached at his own risk. So Saint, we know we, we don't really appreciate the struggles and the difficulties of these great men. He's great Gregory, the theologian, the theologian. And we see him in the icons and we, we venerate the icons and we, we recognize them as the great heroes of the faith. But sometimes we don't know their lives and we don't know what they faced and the dangers they faced. And here he's talking about how boldly he's preaching to them. People did not call the Holy Spirit God. And you will notice in the creed, because it is St. Gregory, who was Archbishop of Constantinople, who presided over the Second Ecumenical Council, that added that last part of the creed. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the creator of life. Okay, he, they doesn't call him God. They didn't use the term God there. And they also didn't use the term homoousios, one in essence with the Father and the Son, even though we believe that. There was so much controversy about the Holy Spirit, and that was in the year 381 when he was the Archbishop of Constantinople. And yet in every possible way, the church affirms that the Holy Spirit is God by calling him Lord, the creator of life, who together with the Father and Son is worshipped and glorified. This We don't worship a creature who spoke through the prophets. So they found the way to make the statement about the divinity of the Spirit without directly calling him God, because a lot of people were hesitant to do so. And when St. Gregory did speak in this way about the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all three of them being equal, equally divine, equally God, he was faced with death threats and also attempts at his life. So people were calling him a tritheist, that he believes in three gods. There were, a lot, there were lots of slanders against him. There were times when people physically attacked him. So when he speaks about doing this at the risk of his own life and still glorifies God, the, he's not just exaggerating here, okay? But I, if I am speaking with risk, thanks be to God nevertheless. In the one case, let him spare those who hate us. In the other May he consecrate us and receive this reward of our preaching to be made perfect by blood. Do you listen? Can you realize what he's saying? That he expects that he might be martyred for saying that the Holy Spirit is God. That did not come to pass, of course. He didn't die because of his preaching, but he could have. So I want to read to you the very end of this incredible sermon of St. Gregory the Theologian. But now it is, it is our duty to dissolve this assembly, for enough has been said. But the festival is never to be put to an end. But let us keep it now, indeed, with our bodies. But a little later on, altogether spiritually, there, in the kingdom of heaven, where we will see the reasons of these things more purely and more clearly, in the word himself, our God and our Lord Jesus Christ, the true festival and rejoicing of the saved, to whom be the glory and worship with the Father and the Holy Spirit, now and ever and unto the ages of ages. Amen. And so he ends his oration on Pentecost. St. Gregory, the theologian, one of the great hierarchs of the church, one of the three great hierarchs, and one of the Cappadocian fathers, from whom we can learn much. Now, we haven't finished discussing the day of Pentecost, because after people were accusing the apostles of being drunk on new wine, Peter stands up and makes a marvelous speech. And next week, we are going to discuss the speech of St. Peter, and some wonderful insights that St. John Chrysostom has about it when Chrysostom actually compares St. Peter to Plato. And uh, you'll enjoy that, I'm sure. So with that, we're going to 
end our discussion for today. And now let us close with a prayer. Lord, now let your servants depart in peace according to your word, for our eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to enlighten the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. Good night. <laughs>